Hi, I'm Margot Hemingway. Welcome to Incredible Idaho. My father, Jack, who's using the age-old excuse to play hooky, has gone fishing. He asked me to guest host the show this month, which is really a great honor for me because it's given me the opportunity to come home. And what a home. <laughs> we moved here when I was 12 years old, and a part of me has never left. Hiking and fishing with my dad is a big part of my growing up here. And during those quiet times, he passed on his fascination with Idaho's wildlife. Our first story tonight is about a large waterfowl called the trumpeter swan. At one time, this bird spread its wings across the entire continental United States. But by 1900, it was feared the trumpeter swan had become extinct. Something stirs in our souls when we hear the hoarse cry of the trumpeter swan. The surprise of a winter white bird rising across a fairyland of snow and ice awakens the childlike wonder in our hearts. This is the essence of grace. 125 years of commercial harvest, coupled with the destruction of critical wetlands, decimated the trumpeter population. Records kept by the Hudson Bay Company show that more than 100,000 swan skins, most of them trumpeters, were traded between 1820 and 1880. By the turn of the century, the trumpeter swan was thought to be extinct. But in the early 1900s, small flocks of them were found near Yellowstone, protected from hunters by the country's first national park. One of these groups in the Harriman Park area of Idaho was sustained by the warm waters of the Henry's Fork. Although biologists later discovered large numbers of trumpeters in the wilderness of Alaska, up until the 1950s, this area was considered the last remaining refuge for the world's largest waterfowl. But after almost a century of providing sanctuary, the Yellowstone ecosystem became the enemy. The winter of 89 saw drought, extreme temperatures, and an overpopulation of waterfowl on the Henry's Fork take a tragic toll. The birds' food base, aquatic plants, were locked beneath the ice, and the die-off began. The big swans were the hardest hit, over 100 trumpeters succumbing to starvation. Then the following winter, large numbers of geese, ducks, and swans returned to the Henry's Fork and literally ate themselves out of house and home, grazing the river bare. Another severe winter would spell disaster. The only answer was to try and move the swans from Harriman to new winter habitats. Well, this is the second winter now that we've moved birds. We moved 353 last year. It's uh, a very tough job. They're, the guys that are doing the trapping, it's, uh, most of it's done at night. The temperatures that are sometimes well below zero. It involves getting out on the river in, in, uh, in very severe conditions and capturing the birds with uh, night lighting technique and then transporting them in boxes to different release sites. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service supplies the funding along with leg bands and numbered collars for the capture operation. The birds are banded and then painted with yellow dye so they can be more easily identified by observers. In July, when they go through the molt, it'll lose the yellow. But next spring, as it heads north, that'll be real helpful to us to follow it. Go. This year, 255 swans were released into milder winter habitats. The four selected sites include Fish Springs, Utah, Summer Lake, Oregon, Fort Hall on the Snake River, and the Bruno Dunes State Park. The people are just really tickled to see these swans in here. They're, they're really excited about them, and they just love them. Wes Whitworth is the park manager at the Bruno Dunes. These are the pioneers now. They're the ones that we, we have lost to this country, lost their migratory roots. And now we're, we have new pioneers back establishing those roots again, the old flyways. Wes's wife, Jan, has become somewhat of an expert on the birds' movements donating her time to record observations for biologists. I think I'm going to have to get closer. Three times a week, Jan covers a 100-mile route in search of trumpeter swans. I'll walk down closer to the water. When they were brought in last year, I got interested in them. The first time that I saw them fly over our house, I fell in love with them. The, they're beautiful birds. 
They're very fascinating. Sometimes it takes quite a while to read the collar numbers. I have to wait until they turn so I can see the whole number. This winter, 30 swans returned to Bruno Park from the original release over a year ago. Some brought their offspring or signets, an encouraging sign that new traditions are being established. There was one swan in particular who had left the Teton Basin and Ruth didn't know where this swan had gone. And I read the collar up here and she was really excited to find out he'd come up here. Hi, this is Ruth Shea. If you're calling with information regarding a trumpet or swan sighting, please leave the details. You're Calls from the public and volunteers like Jan Whitworth, along with biologists' own sightings, build a picture of how well the trumpeters are adjusting to their new winter homes. And the way this is set up, a person can really watch a swan almost fly across the page from place to place. Here's a bird here that flew from Harriman to Yellowstone Lake and then came back into Teton Basin over by Driggs. The data shows that adult swans are more likely to return to their old habitat near Harriman Park. But the cygnets, or younger swans, seem more willing to establish new traditions. I guess I regard last year as a success very definitely from the one point of view that in December, the temperatures fell to 58 below zero at Harriman. I believe that if we had been doing nothing and we had had six or seven hundred swans piled in there, that we would have had a bunch of dead swans last year. And just the fact that we didn't, to me, is success. Now, right now there's a group of about 85 or 90 up there on the bank just in front of us. The trumpeter swan is very social, maintaining close family bonds and congregating in groups, calling back and forth and displaying to each other. Now for the first time in a hundred years, their old haunts will hear the distinctive cry of the trumpeter swan echoing through the winter stillness. To me, the lesson the trumpeters teach is, is really how fragile our resources are and how, I guess, the, the scariest thing is once we lose something, people so quickly forget and don't even realize it's been gone.